Now, I know that some of you know Sue Ann Egan, who was in that video. Sue Ann was the administrator for student ministries when I came here 18 years ago as a youth pastor. She still serves in that capacity. Many of us were walked with her during that difficult time when Rich was diagnosed. I just so love the way she put that. The question we all ask when difficult things come, where is God? And then the answer, in, in the presence, in her heart, in his people, in his word, was with her. Which is really at the heart of what we're going to talk about here in this series as we begin our Advent series leading us right up to Christmas Eve. The promise, the presence, the power of Emmanuel, God with us. What does that really mean, God with us? Is that something that we just say at Christmas time to make ourselves feel good? Or is there anything in that for us during the other 364 days a year? We begin this series, as I said, on this Advent series and this season, which begins in our culture, I think before Halloween, when Starbucks releases their Christmas cups. That's when you know the season's upon us. Or maybe when Hallmark begins to show the endless same story with the same actors with a different title. Of Christmas movies. But that's not neither here nor there. Culturally speaking, it's the time of shopping and wrapping and buying and baking and inviting and planning and doing all of those things, which can be a lot of fun, but also exhausting. I remember when my kids were young, we would go to Christmas Eve service in the afternoon here, drive to my in-law's house in Wheaton, have dinner, open presents, sometimes go to their late midnight service, drive home, go to sleep. My son would get us up at whatever o'clock in the morning to open our presents. Then we'd drive to my parents' house in Crystal Lake and spend the rest of the day there. By the 26th, we were fried, just fried. Looked like a toy bomb went off in our house. We were just exhausted. Sometimes it can feel that way, doesn't it? Just trying to get through it. Have you ever, you don't have to raise your hand because it would be, you know, not in the spirit of the season, but I would guess some of you have felt this way, like I just can't wait for it to be over, get back to life as normal. It's, you know, you don't want to admit that, but sometimes we feel that way. There's so much to do. Historically, for Christians, Advent, the word Advent means arrival. It's been a season of preparation, of anticipation, and of worship at the arrival of Christ. The signature moment, the incarnation, God come down. For many of us, if we're totally honest, it can be exhausting. Not a lot of time for reflection or rest. 78% of Americans say they do feel happier during the holidays. 84% they say they feel more stress during the holidays. Of those 78% that say they feel happier, 90% of those say they don't feel as happy as they think they should. Which is a strange, how do you even ask that question on a survey? Don't feel as happy as I think I should. I should feel different. It's just an interesting time. And I want, we, the whole heart for us in this series, and what Together at Christmas really means, is to focus in so we don't miss it. Our theme is with, the singular word with, coming from that name, God with us. We don't just mean with our friends or with our family or with each other in church. We mean the truth of Emmanuel, God with us. We're going to spend four weeks on this singular name. You might think that's a long time to spend on one name. It's actually just scratching the surface of all that we could say. Because you might remember back to our Hebrews series at the beginning of the fall when we talked in Hebrews chapter 1, 2, and 3 that Jesus is greater than all that exists, than the universe, than the angels, than the prophets, than all things. In fact, we're told in Hebrews chapter 1, all things hold together by a word of his power. What Emmanuel means, God with us means, is that God who set the stars in place, who created the universe, who holds it all together by word of his power. That God is not far off and distant and hard to know. He's with us. He's present in a personal and powerful way. Today we begin with the promise of Emmanuel. A number of years ago I read a book by a man named Ethelbert Stauffer. A very unfortunate name, but a good book. He says in the introduction to this book called Christ and the Caesars, it's examining the place of Jesus in his first century context in the Roman world. He says, one of the oldest longings of human history is the longing for God to appear on earth. And he spends a whole chapter then unpacking what that means. There's in us as human beings this deep notion and desire for God to come, even if we don't say it that way. And this is why you see throughout human history across the different parts of the globe and in different cultures, civilizations, these repeated myths of God showing up or gods. The Greeks had them, Romans have them, Persians had them, Babylonians had them, the old Norse mythology had them, gods showing up in human form. 
And some skeptics, in fact, C.S. Lewis was one of these, have said, well, that's a reason not to believe the Christ myth. It's just another one of these myths. Lewis came to realize that maybe, just maybe, there's a reason why all these different human cultures have the same desire underlying these mythologies for God to show up. And maybe it's pointing to a central truth, the time when God actually did show up. Lewis called it the myth that became fact. He said the Christ myth is like all other myths working on us in the same way with one tremendous difference. It actually happened. It's not just a story. God. I can't tell my, oh, I'm back. Hey, just keeping you on your toes or your seats. At times in the ancient world, uh, this, this would show up in different ways. In fact, in the Bible itself, in Acts chapter 14, we see that um, J- uh, Paul and Barnabas are visiting the ancient city of Lystra. And they do miracles in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit. They, do, they perform some miracles and preach. And the people are so enamored with this that they say, Zeus and Hermes have come to us. And Paul and Barnabas said, no, 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 we're not gods. But they were so quick to believe that they were. And sometimes in the ancient world and in the modern world, this gets politicized, this longing for God to come, and we make it out that the king or the ruler or the leader is divine, is the incarnate version of God, that God in the flesh. A couple examples of this from the ancient world. Uh, In Egypt, Pharaoh Tutmos III had engraved on the steps of his palace, the God of heaven is my father and I am his son. In ancient Persia, King Xerxes the God King himself, said, the days of salvation have now begun in my advent. And in ancient Rome, Augustus Caesar, it was, this was printed on the, the coins for his, for his inauguration or the advent of his reign. Welcome him who is the longed for one, the savior of all mankind. Think about that language there. The God of heaven is my father, I am his son. Now is the time of salvation. Welcome him who is the longed for one, the savior of all mankind. This combination of longing for God to show up and for a human ruler, it's, it, it's coming from the same root. This desire in us, even if it's deep, deep down in our subconscious, that someday someone will show up and fix it. Set the world right. It doesn't take a prophet to tell you the world's a broken place. Every advent of every new ruler or king or even president touches on, plays on this longing. Don't you see this in our own political cycles? Election year, maybe not the most recent election so much, let's forget about that one, but just in general, don't you see this in our own election cycles? The promise of now this person, these policies, this party will fix it. And and we are tempted to attach our hopes to that. It's because it's deep in us. It's a human longing as old as we are for someday some divine ruler to show up and make all things right. Okay, now with that as a backdrop to the ancient world and the contemporary modern world, let's read what's probably a familiar passage to you, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, the story of Jesus' birth. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, I know that's familiar to you. Maybe you hear it different, though, when read in the context of this longing we have for someone someday to show up and fix all things, set the world right. The promise begins with a dream to Joseph. Notice we're told Joseph and Mary are betrothed. You probably think of engaged. It's similar but a little different. In the ancient first century Jewish world, to be betrothed was much more binding than our engagement idea. 
It was actually viewed the same as a marriage. You just hadn't consummated that un uh, yet on your wedding day. It was a year-long process, a legal contract in which you were bound and you could not get out of, nor would you want to, unless certain things happened. The top of the list would be breaking the marriage vows by being with another. So Joseph is betrothed to Mary. They're in this year process of preparing where she would live with her family. He would prepare a house usually built onto the side of his family's home to bring her into his home and to become his bride. And then this happens. Notice the angel visits him in a dream, and the first thing the angel says is what? Do not fear, which the angels are always saying. Which in our modern minds, if you think of an angel as like a cute baby with wings and a harp or maybe a bow and arrow, which, you know, like, or, or just like, you know, lovely, shiny people, that doesn't make much sense. But in the Old Testament and in the scriptures, angels are beings that reflect the holiness and glory of God. And so whenever we see them as human beings, it's terrifying. You're getting a glimpse of the holiness of God and you become, you come face to face with how unholy you are. And you tremble, you quake, people fall down as dead. And so the angel says, to be expected, do not fear. Now I want you to, first thing I want to see here is the promise of this son. The promise of a son to, to Joseph. An adopted son. He knows it's not his, biologically speaking. Now the Jewish law of the day required that Joseph should put Mary away. Meaning, you got two options really. She's clearly broken the vows. She's betrayed you. So you, you put her away, meaning you're not going to marry her. You could do that in one of two ways. Number one, you could, it was your right, to publicly shame her, meaning you would announce the reason why you're not going to get married, and you would sort of say, listen, this was not my doing. She did this, not me. She was with another man, therefore I'm not going through with it. That would be a public humiliation for her, would basically make her a pariah for life, but it would sort of keep your reputation intact. It was Joseph's right to do that. Or he could decide to do it quietly. Perhaps move or have her move, say nothing about it. But either way, he can't go through with the wedding. And he's decided to do it the second way, which would be less common. Because he, presumably, he loves her. His heart's broken. Think about, just think about Joseph for a minute. But my dream for my life was the woman I love, to marry her, to be together, to raise a family. It's over before it gets started. She's pregnant. What do I do? I'm angry so I could shame her, but I love her and I want to honor God, so I don't want to humiliate her. I just want it to go away. Brokenhearted. Can you, can you imagine Joseph, like, on, at night, wrestling with this? Because the text actually says he, he was considering these things. What do I do? How do I get out of this? What should I do? He decides that evening... I'm, I'm not going to humiliate her. I'm just going to end it quietly. And let's read verse 20 again. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. One of the things I love about this story is the perfect timing of God. It's perfect. At the moment when Joseph needed it most, God speaks to him. He's wrestling with what, it's a crossroads in his life, isn't it? This is a turning point. This is a moment of truth for Joseph. What do I do? My heart is broken. Where are you, God? Similarly to when Sue Ann cried out, where are you? This is not how this is supposed to go. How could this happen? And God speaks. Don't be afraid. I know it looks unlikely, but I've got a different plan here. Perhaps you've felt God speak to you in some way in the moment you needed it most. Through a song, through his word, through the words of another, just in your heart. I love the perfect timing of God here when he comes to Joseph. Now Luke's account tells us that Mary has already had her own angelic visitor. Gabriel himself speaks to Mary and says, you're favored among God. Now she's a 14, 13, 14, 15 year old teenage girl. And she's betrothed to Joseph. And he says, you're going to conceive by the Holy Spirit. Don't you think Mary wondered what will that be like? Right? And then she says at the end, may it be to me as you have said. Now she would have had to tell Joseph about this, right? She can't hide it. Like physically she can't hide it if she's going to be pregnant. She would have had to tell him. Presumably Joseph didn't believe it. Okay, Mary, if you say so. And then she is pregnant. I, I'm projecting here, but I imagine Joseph thinking, was this all a cover-up? 
because she betrayed me? Was this all some sort of spiritualized concoction so that she could get away with betraying me? He's a conflicted guy, and then the angel speaks to him and confirms the very thing he heard his bride-to-be say. The Holy Spirit will conceive in you a son. You're going to have a son. You're going to call him Yeshua, Jesus, which means God saves. And then we get this interesting line about what the point of his name is and what he's actually going to do, the purpose of this son coming. This is the promise of a Savior. First, the angel says, don't be afraid, you're going to have a son. That's good news. Second, the promise of a Savior. Now, for Joseph to hear this child is going to be the Messiah, it's hard for us to think about it this way, but how many of you moms out there, when you found out you were pregnant, had big plans and dreams and visions for who or what your child might become? We all do, right? Parents, you think about, what, I want to raise my child. We just dedicated children. Think about their future and who they might become, what they might accomplish, who they might be, what their life and heart and mind might grow into. For a young first century Jewish girl to hear, you're going to give birth to the Messiah. Now, it's hard for us to get this, but the prophets for centuries were saying, someday God's going to bring his Messiah. Don't you think every little Jewish girl wondered, maybe it's my kid. It's got to be somebody's kid. Someday a Jewish ruler is going to be raised up by God to deliver God's people like Moses did. Maybe it's going to be my son. And to hear that, when Joseph hears that, would have been unbelievable news. But then he hears this interesting phrase in verse 21. Let me read it again for you. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This would have been very confusing to Joseph. Save his people from their sins. You know, we hear the message of Christmas, and we hear, you know, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. By the way, that's not actually anything the Bible says. It says, peace on earth and goodwill to those on whom his favor rests, which means in Christ. We sort of have this, like, this sort of general vague notion that the baby in the manger, not sure how it connects, but it means everybody's okay and God loves us. Kind of like at Easter time. There's eggs and there's a bunny. We don't know what they have to do with Jesus, but we celebrate them and it's all sort of part of the thing we do. For many in our culture, the baby in the manger is sort of disconnected from, I don't know what that means exactly, but it means, it means in some strange way God's nice and he loves everyone. That's not the gospel message. That's not the message of Christmas. The message of Christmas, the message of Emmanuel, has a much harder edge to it than that. It's right there in the statement. For he will save his people from their sins. Now, the first century Jewish concept of salvation is not this. The, it, is, it is political, military, economic, and social deliverance from their oppressors, Rome. Just like God did it way back in Exodus when it was Egypt that kept them enslaved, God is going to do it again through the ultimate deliverer, the Messiah, the second Moses, if you will, who's going to come and lead us out of the oppression of Rome and the Caesars. And he's going to establish the Davidic kingdom, reestablish the throne of David. We're going to become militarily powerful, wealthy, prosperous, again, God's favored people, because the deliverer is going to come. In other words, they grow up thinking someday a great king's going to be born and he's going to fix it. But the text says, the angel says to Joseph, not someday, Joseph, you're going to give birth, your wife will give birth to a son and he will throw over the Romans, but he'll save his people from their sins. You know the story in Luke 5, some of you know the story about the healing of the paralytic. How many of you heard this story before? Four friends bring their friend who's paralyzed, quadriplegic, presumably, to Jesus, but he can't get into the house because it's jammed with people. And they rip open the roof of his home, which wasn't very considerate to the homeowner, but that's not part of the story. Maybe Jesus fixed the roof. I don't know. And they lower him down on a mat in front of Jesus' feet. They lower him down. He's, he can't move. And Jesus sees him there, and he says, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees and re religious leaders who are watching this they say and they grumble in their hearts and in their minds, who does this guy think he is? Only God can forgive sin. And Jesus hears their thoughts, knows what's in their hearts. And he says publicly to the whole crowd that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. I tell you, get up and walk, and the man does. That story is, you might not think it was a Christmas story, it's so profound. What is Jesus saying? 
He's saying to that guy and to us, your big issue is not physical. Your big problem is not economic. It's not social. It's not political. Your big issue is your sin, is your heart that has separated you from God. And that's what I came to fix. That's what's wrong with the world. The central heart of the gospel is not political, social, economic. There are political and economic and social applications and implications of the gospel. But the heart of it is that what you, what's wrong with you and with me is our sin. And God sends a Savior to deal with that. Everything else is ancillary. This would have been radical to Joseph. In other words, the baby in the manger can't be separated from the Christ on the cross. They have to go together. Otherwise, it's just a strange story about a baby born in a stable. For what? To save his people from their sins. The heart of the gospel, friends, is that there's sin in the world. There's brokenness and there's evil. And it's not out there because of them. It's in here because of us. Now, that doesn't tweet well today. You don't get a lot of likes and retweets if you post that. But it's true. And the message of Christmas is that God loved us enough to come and deal with the real problem. The world then and now is full of political leaders, military leaders, economic leaders, promising deliverance. And it never delivers. Because ultimately speaking, it's not the real problem. The promise of a Savior, unlike anything the world expected or wants even to hear about sometimes. Last, the promise of Emmanuel. The promise of Emmanuel. And, and Matthew gives a little commentary here after the angel finishes speaking to Joseph. Perhaps you, you saw this or you, you caught this, but let me read verses 22 and 23 again. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which means God with us. Now, so in verse 21, the angel says, what's in your womb, Mary, uh, your wife's, to be's womb, is conceived of the Holy Spirit. End of period, quotations, end of the angelic statement. And then Matthew comments on this and says, this whole thing, what whole thing? The story of Jesus' birth took place to fulfill what was already talked about by the prophet, which prophet? The prophet Isaiah. 733 years earlier. Isaiah, during the reign of King Ahaz, says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. He's saying this whole thing is part of the larger story of God's deliverance. 700 years before the angel shows up and speaks to Joseph. Now, the actual name Emmanuel shows up only three times in the whole Bible. Twice in Isaiah chapter 7 and once here in, in Matthew chapter 1. But the concept of God with us is all over the story of God in the scriptures. You, you, could think, you could make the case that the whole Bible is really the story of God with us and us losing that withness of God, the presence of God, and trying to regain it on our own and failing and God bringing it in Christ. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God creates us in his image. To what? To be with him in relationship. Genesis 3, we violate his law and his will, and because of that, we are cut off from his presence. That's the whole imagery of out of the garden, east of Eden, flaming sword, can't go back, right? We're cut off from his presence that way. And then Genesis 11, the people of the earth build this big ziggurat tower called the Tower of Babel. Remember this story? What are they doing? trying to regain the presence, to bring down the presence of God. But you can't do that on your own because of our sin. And over and over again, Exodus 33, Moses cries out, unless you go with me, I won't go. And in, in Genesis 28, Jacob has the dream at Bethel where he says, surely God was in this place. He was with me, and I didn't even know it. He wrestles in Genesis 32 with the angel of God, realizing this is actually the presence of God. There are these hints of God's presence, which we can't quite recapture because of our sin. The whole story is not the story of a present reality, but something we lost and are desperately longing to get back, even if we don't name it that way, the presence of God in our lives and how God in his love brings it to us in Christ, in the Son. That's what the angel is saying to Joseph. The whole story comes to this point, Joseph. You and the woman you're thinking about putting away quietly, you're my plan. 
to bring my son into the world through you, through her, who will save his people from their sins. And that will allow you to be in my presence, to have Emmanuel again, God with us. This is the cry of the psalmist. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 27. My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. It's the whole meaning of the tabernacle in the, in the wilderness, and the temple in Jerusalem, the presence of God. The whole thing is about getting back the presence of God. Let me ask this question of you. What's the greatest gift God could give you? What's the, what, what's the, you know, my kids are old now, older, and Christmas is gift cards and cash. It's not, the magic is sort of worn off a little bit of the days when they would have big presents to open and big surprises. But, and maybe you, you think back to those days, the, the big thing you wanted for Christmas. If I asked you, what's the best thing God could give you? What do you want most from him? Forgiveness? Peace? Comfort? Reconciliation of some relationship, purpose in your life. The best thing he could give you is himself. Friends, the best thing God could ever give you is the gift of his presence, the gift of himself. Because everything else God gives, he gives in the context of himself. Sinclair Ferguson says it this way, there's no such thing that Jesus takes apart from himself and then hands over to us, as it were. There is only Jesus himself. So in other words, if you ask God for grace and for comfort and for mercy and for forgiveness and for peace, you're asking God for God. What you're really saying is, give me more of you, God. Because that's the way he gives you those things. They aren't, they aren't dis disconnected from him. In the, we, when we say Emmanuel, God with us, we're saying all of it, all of his comfort and joy and peace and mercy and forgiveness and love in his presence. What you need more than anything else in your life is the presence of God. Think about it. Sue Ann said it. In moments of pain or fear or doubt, the presence of God, Emmanuel. In moments of victory and joy, to remember this isn't about me, Emmanuel, God with us. Matthew's gospel begins 123 with these promise of God with us, right? You know how it ends in Matthew 28, how it ends? Jesus, on the mountaintop, after his crucifixion and resurrection, before he ascends to heaven, what does he say? I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew's whole story begins and ends with the promise of God's presence with us. In fact, the Bible ends this way in Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. The whole story, from beginning to end, is about God bringing back his presence into our lives. It's what you need most. It's what you long for most, even if you don't know it. At the end of his life, the great preacher and hymn writer, Jonathan Wesley, was surrounded by his children as he was dying. And among his last words were these. He's, he reportedly raised his hand from his bed and said in a voice just above a whisper, the best of all is Emmanuel. Isn't that good? Last words, the best thing of all is God with us. We're going to spend the next several weeks digging into what this means and how it applies to our lives. My prayer for my own heart, for my family, and for you, our church family, is that this season you would discover in a way you never have before God with us. God with you. Let's stand together for closing prayer. Father, we acknowledge that our biggest issue is not political or economic or social or anything else. Our big problem, the big problem in the world, is that we have wandered from you because of our sin. And we have lost access to your presence. And the great news at Christmas, this Advent season, is that you have made a way back into your presence through your son Jesus, who is Emmanuel, God with us. We praise and thank you in his name. Amen.
Before you go, I'd like to just remind you, if you'd like to have someone pray with you, as we do every week, we'd love to meet with you down front at the close of the service to, for prayer. Now, brothers and sisters, go in the grace of Emmanuel, God with you. Amen. And go in peace.